Today, here in Nashville, we are concluding the greatest campaign that we've seen thus far in the United States. During the past week alone, as you have already heard, more than 250,000 people have come here to Vanderbilt Stadium to hear the gospel. The total attendance thus far has been nearly 650,000. Hundreds and thousands have marched across this turf to find Christ as Lord and Savior and Master. These meetings have reached deeper and wider into the social and political structure of this city than any campaign that I've ever witnessed. There have been more tears of repentance shed than in any city that we've ever been to. This last Wednesday night, we had an all-night prayer meeting with hundreds of people meeting in the First Presbyterian Church all night. One lady said that she went at 11 o'clock to stay an hour and could not leave until 6 the next morning. She said, I had never prayed over 15 minutes at a time in my entire life. One young showgirl from Broadway visiting in Nashville was at a party on the same night. At about midnight, a strange feeling came upon her. She felt as though she were going to die. She told her friends she must find God. She got in a taxi, came over to the church, and at midnight was gloriously converted to Christ. I could tell you story after story of what God has been doing in this Tennessee city during the past four weeks. One outstanding businessman of the city had been coming to the meetings. He began to realize his need of God. He was unfaithful to his wife, and his home was almost on the rocks. At 2 o'clock in the morning, he got out of his bed, went over and picked up a new Bible that he had just purchased, and happened to open it to John 3.16. He read those glorious words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He knelt down by his bed and found peace with God. His home is reunited, and he is rejoicing in the newfound Savior. I want to take as my text today this famous passage that millions of people know by heart. This text is the golden kernel of divine truth. It is the core, the nucleus, the very essence of the gospel. If the entire Bible were destroyed, this verse, John 3:16, would remain indelibly etched upon the fleshy tablets of the heart of mankind, and its truths, simple, concise, and complete, would be sufficient to lead lost humanity to God. It is the fundamental chord of truth from which all gospel harmony emanates. In it can be heard the deep, harsh tone of man's sin and God's judgment, but its melody sweeps upward to the glorious overtones of love, sacrifice and atonement. Its symphonic beauty is exceeded only by the majesty of its message. Its message is so simple that a child can readily understand it. However, its truth is so profound that the intellectual cannot fail to appreciate it. Its idiom is so universal that interpretations in any language do not alter its meaning. It has been called the gospel in a nutshell. Others have said that this verse of scripture is a miniature Bible. It contains only 25 words, but it is God's truth in concentrate. It is the gospel boiled down for human consumption. In this verse, we have a picture of a gift being given to mankind. The author of that gift is God. The verb of deity is give. The verb of humanity is get. In the drama of life, God always plays the role of benefactor. He gives freely with no thought of return. Through the miracle of birth, he gives us life itself. He gives us the oxygen and a set of lungs to assimilate the gases which sustain life. He doles out the heartbeats at a rate of 90,000 every day and keeps the regularity of respiration on an even keel. The gifts of sight, speech, hearing, feeling, and smell are gifts from his bountiful hand. The food we eat comes from God's soil. The milk we drink comes from the cows which were created for our benefit. The steel for our automobiles comes from the heart of God's earth. The basic raw materials which are used in our modern mechanical devices are supplied to the processors without cost. The oil and gasoline and related products, endless in their supply, come to us from God's great storehouse without cost. We only pay for man's work in processing them and conveying them to us. These temporal benefits given so freely by the Almighty are but physical symbols of his great spiritual generosity. These material gifts, without which we could not exist physically, are tokens of that supreme gift without which can be no spiritual life. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, God is the author of many gifts, but he is also the author of the greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ. Secondly, what was the motive behind God's great gift? John 3:16 teaches that the incentive of the gift was love. For God so loved, there's a man-made adage which says, the Lord helps those who help themselves. But God's love goes deeper than this. In the redemptive work of Calvary, God helped men who could not help themselves. We were helpless and hopeless. But God's love bridged the chasm and man's hopeless despair and carried him as a wounded lamb back into the fold of reconciliation. Since God is love, 
The further a nation drifts from God, the more hate-conscious it becomes. Hatred, malice, and selfish aggression are the fruits of godlessness. It is significant that communism usually finds acceptance in the nations where the gospel of Christ and the love of God have been rejected. Hatred and love cannot abide together. Light and darkness are not coexistent. Truth and deceit do not mix. If there ever was an hour when the message of John 3.16 needs to be declared from the housetops, it is today. The political hell which communism creates by its rejection of God's love is a symbol of the actual hell which awaits all men who obey not the gospel of Christ. The most effective way to fight hatred is by the power of love. The enemies of Christ thought they had stopped Christianity at Calvary, but they had not considered the triumphant power of Christ's love. His reaction to the personal pain, the cruel mockings, the stark injustice of his crucifixion was, for Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. This was not a love which condoned their sin and evil, nor was it a blind love which ignored the magnitude of their guilt, but it was conquering, forgiving love, which has come to be irresistible and invincible. In this hour when hatred, deceit, and political intrigue are in vogue throughout the world, let us pray the God of love to fill our hearts overwhelmingly with his spirit and give us as Americans a new baptism of divine love. The validity of Paul's words, therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him, if he thirst give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, has been proven in the recent food program for East Germany. Someday we will discover that love never faileth and that a sincere manifestation of the love of God will do more to humble the enemy than atomic and hydrogen bombs. The love of God emerged triumphant in the solving of the world's greatest problem, sin, and there is no reason to believe that it will be less effective if sincerely applied to our modern problems today. Thirdly, we see what the greatest gift was as expressed in John 3:16. He gave his only begotten son. Have you ever wondered why Jesus had to die or why God gave his only son to atone for the sins of lost humanity? Christ's death on Calvary was no afterthought with God. God gave Jesus first of all because it was a part of the divine plan. Listen to the Bible. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. God foreknew the fall of man and foreplanned our redemption. Christ was the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world and was foreordained to atone for the sins of the race. Again, the scripture teaches that God gave Jesus as a sacrifice for sin was that he was alone, was willing to die and atone and could die and atone for man's sin. Jesus Christ was the only one that had the capacity in his body to die for the sins of the entire world. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible teaches that Christ voluntarily died on the cross because he alone could die for the sins of mankind and be acceptable to God and justify the soul in the sight of God. Who to whom does this apply? The Bible teaches that the love of God and the gift of God applies to all that it believes. It is universal because man's sin is universal. John 3.16 says, Whosoever and God's love in order to meet the universal need of man must needs be universal. No one is excluded from the gospel invitation. The vile and sinful are not too low to be lifted by its power. The intellectuals are not too wise to appreciate and be drawn by its unique message. The rich are not too high to be humbled by its challenge. In the kingdom of God, poverty is no handicap. Riches are no advantage. The sins of the colored man are as quickly forgiven as the black sins of the white man. God in his estimate of men is no respecter of persons. He considers that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God so the hand of his mercy is universally extended to all. The Russian who approaches the throne of grace in humble repentance and faith finds favor and forgiveness as quickly as does the most loyal American. The red Chinese, with all of his political delusions, is just as precious in God's sight as a priceless child of an American home. Christ died not only for the lovely, but for the unlovely. Yes, that beautiful, inclusive word, whosoever, shows the universality of God's gift. A Christian work in the slums of London speaking to a group of 300 ragged children, placed a sixpence on the Bible and challenged, Whosoever believe it, let him come and take it. With one voice they agreed that they wanted the sixpence. But one little boy, a little more ragged than the others, walked up, bolted to the desk, took the coin and said, Thank you, sir. The Christian worker said, What is your name? Cecil Smithers, the little boy answered. But did I say that Cecil Smithers should have the sixpence, asked the missionary? No, sir, said the boy, but you did say whosoever, and that means me. Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we all need salvation. But only those 
who dare to believe that whosoever means them personally will receive everlasting life. Ladies and gentlemen, do you want everlasting life? Do you want to be forgiven of all your sins as thousands of people in Vanderbilt Stadium have these past four weeks? Then you can be the whosoever. You can put your name in John 3.16. You can receive Christ, believe on him, accept him, trust him, surrender to him. Every sin you've ever committed will be forgiven and then he will give you eternal life. You shall not perish, but shall have eternal life is the message of John 3.16 and the message of the Bible from cover to cover. He can be yours today. Will you receive God's gift at this moment? Let him transform and change your life as you heard these testimonies a moment ago from the thousands here in Nashville. You can right now.